Hi, everybody. Welcome to CC Midweek. This is my favorite day of the month. I look forward to it so much. Look at that little stud muffin. Christian Berger, everybody. <laughs> like I'm going to sit down. I, um, I recently went on vacation, and I talked last month about how every day of my month was filled. And I was like, vacation is the answer, right? Rest is what mama needs. And so we went on vacation. Jake organized it all. He got this little house in Michigan, and it had a little beach, and it had a lake, and it had a pontoon you could rent. And um, the first day we got there, it was raining, so we kind of chilled. I, was, I got to read. I woke up early, and it was still kind of raining, and I went out on the paddleboard. I haven't been on the paddleboard, so I was out early before anyone was on the lake, and I was just trying to soak it all in. I went and spent time with God, and I'm like, I'm going to spend a little extra time before anybody gets up, just me and God. And I thought I had, like, all these answers. And I, I started working out. I was like, we're going to work out every day. This is what I need. But man, something inside just wasn't right. Have you ever been there where it, it feels like David was just talking about it? Like, you feel like you're doing the right things, but something internal feels off. Someone give me an amen. amen. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And... I, I was spending this time with God, and I was like, God, what is going on? What is this feeling? And I, I was stopped in my tracks by Psalm 23. Now, we know Psalm 23 a lot because you'll see it at, like, in the movies for funerals, or it's kind of known for a funeral uh, passage. But there's this beautiful verse, and it says, Psalms 23, 3, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I read another verse, and it was like, uh, he's going to renew a clean spirit within you. And it kept going back to this internal thing, like the soul. And I was like, okay, I hear you, but what the heck is the soul? Can I get any other amen? <laughs> I've been in church my whole life. I have an idea of that, like the soul is this internal piece of me. I know that my soul, like, is longing for God. I know when I hear the first time I heard Otis Redding, I was like, oh, God is good. You know, like my soul connected to the music. I, um, but... Other than that, and then I was like, okay, your soul leaves, like your body's going to stay and your soul's going to go up, almost like the, um, the like cartoon image when they die or like uh, uh, Tom and Jerry, right? Tom would get hit and then his soul would float above him with wings, right? So I have some little ridiculous definition of the soul, but really what is the soul? And so I went into a dive, and I started, like, looking up people that I trusted. I started looking in Scripture, like, what does the Scripture have to say about it? And Dallas Willard, he has a phenomenal definition. I think through this sermon and Sunday sermon, you're going to hear a lot from Dallas Willard. You're going to hear a lot from Louis Giglio. And um, uh, I forget the woman's name. I'm reading her book right now. I'll give her credit Sunday. <laughs> um, but I want to give credit where it's due because it's not all my ideas. So Dallas Willard, he says that the soul is our internal being. And it's made up of more than just one part. It's made up of our mind. So our thoughts and our emotions are part of our soul. It's made up of our will, which is like our intent. Like, what are my intentions for my family? What are my intentions with God? What are my intentions? That is our will. And then the soul is also made up of your body. It's the part where uh, you have body language, right? Jake will look at me sometimes we're in a fight, and he's like, why are you looking at me like that? And I'm like, like what? You know, like I couldn't even hide it because it's, it's the body language of the soul, and it's your choices. 
So the soul is not just one thing. It's, it's all of your being. It's all of who you are internally. And here's the thing about the soul is no one can see my thoughts. No one can see my intentions. Jake can figure out my body <laughs> language pretty good, but my choices that I'm making, sometimes those are hidden choices. And so the thing about the soul is it sometimes can be crying out, but it's hard to hear it. It's hard to, like, pinpoint it and label it because the thing about the soul is everything kind of comes out sideways. Uh, it comes out through our emotions, and it comes out through our relationships, and it comes out through our choices. And so it's not always easy to pinpoint what was going on. But when I heard this definition of the soul, I was thinking to myself, man, I was taking good care of my body. I was taking good care of that part of my will that had intent because I wanted to know about God. I was seeking him. But my struggle was with my thought life. See, I think we can have healthy pieces, but the soul craves harmony. The soul craves like a continuity, uh, this integration so that all of us is working together in the kind of way that brings life, in the kind of way that we feel alive. We feel alive as a person. We feel alive in our relationship with God. We feel alive in our relationship with others. The soul craves this integration. But what happens is when one piece is off, we get symptoms, okay? So I was on vacation, and... I'm now, my kids are old enough where I'm kind of like, I get made fun of a lot. Like, do not take a picture if you're a mom around my kids, okay? They're like, are you Zooming? <laughs> College kids, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, I do the Zoom, so now I don't Zoom, but I'm at this age where they just, they rip on you, okay? And it's all in good nature, it's all fun, but something of my thought life was unhealthy, and I was feeling bad, and when they started teasing me, it wasn't just my kids being fun and silly. It was they don't really want to be around me anymore. And that's what became a voice that I heard, but I didn't hear it because I was busy. So it was a voice that was happening, but I wasn't truly paying attention to it outwardly. So internally, we have this voice and I can't wait to talk to you more about this. This part has, is going to be really good. This is going to be Sunday, okay? <laughs> because the unholy one, I think we think a lot about life of like, God is good, he is at work. But there is also an enemy who is alive, who is real, and who is at work. And I did a deep dive study into what does his voice sound like. Like when he shows up in scripture, what the heck does it sound like? Because if I can't identify what the enemy sounds like and I just soak it all in and just am sitting there, I'm not going to realize it until it's too late and I'm de-energized and I'm grouchy and I'm trying to figure life out, but I've already given the enemy a seat at my table. I heard a guy, his name's Louie, and he talked about this idea. And he said that he is a pastor, he um, he leads Passion Conference, Passion Church, and it's a huge thing for 20-somethings. Um, for college-age kids, high school kids, it'll be like 20,000, hey? It's like thousands and tens of thousands of people will go to this conference every year. And he said that something happened at church, he's a leader, and leadership is hard. Anyone else got an amen for that one? <laughs> yeah, leadership's hard. And something happened with someone he was close to, and it caused a deep rift, and it caused a deep brokenness, but it was one of those things that it was like, it, was, it had to be private. But Louis was hurt really very bad by it, and his wife was hurt by it. And they were struggling for months and months. And Louis Giglio, one night, he was on his way home, and he got a text message that was like the vindication text message. Like, whatever had happened, he doesn't say. Whatever had happened uh, kind of, I guess, came out in another way. 
and Louis was vindicated. So he texted one of his best friends who had walked with him through this, helped him spiritually, and he said, Louis probably late 50s, early 60s, he said, it took me about a half hour to type the text message because I was putting everything in there. Like, you are never going to believe this. I knew this would happen one day. Can you believe this all came out? And he was like, vindication. And he said, I was sitting in the car waiting. And I knew he was going to, you know, it was going to be a lengthy text back because we had been living this together and it was finally vindication. And he said he was waiting and he was waiting and then he got a text and he said he could see like the completion of it without even opening it. So he's like, oh, he forgot to type the rest. So he's still going to be typing. So he's like, so I waited. I didn't even read what it said. I just waited. And he waited. <laughs> And he waited, and there was no more. And he opened the text message, and it said, Do not give the enemy a seat at your table. In Psalms 23, it's kind of broken up in two different sections. It's almost like David has a switch. And the first half, he talks about the shepherd. And it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What if God has a great plan for our life? What if God has prepared a table before us that represents something of the beauty of what he wants for our life? The beauty of what he wants for our internal well-being, our whole being, our soul. And he prepares this table for us, but we pull up a seat, we sit down, and then we offer a seat to all the wrong things. I was talking to my kids, and I was giving this analogy of, like, God prepared this life for you. What are some of the things that we invite to the table that have no place being there? And one of the ideas was, like, expectations. My daughter, Taylor, she's in college, and she made a choice to commute because she wanted to be able to be a big part of the church. And she's commuting, but what's happening is she's seeing all the posts of all her friends going back to college, and she's seeing all of them hanging out and having this good time, and now she's going to college, and she's got no friends, and the expectation is not being met. And then she's seeing the pictures, and then there's a comparison. Look at what they have. I feel disappointed. Did I just throw you under the bus? We didn't talk about that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we'll catch up later. <laughs> she, <Yeah. laughs> She's got plenty of friends. Just joking, guys. <laughs> oh, your mom. My dad, when I was a little girl, he's a preacher, and he used to... He, everyone knows my dad. He's not. But he... I would... <laughs> Hey guys, I got a dad. His name's Dave Collings. Uh, he, he, if I was sitting in the back, I'd be sitting in the back with some of my friends, and he would literally stop service. I love you, dad. He's watching online right now. He would literally stop service, and if we were talking, he'd be like, Sarah, I think you need to come and sit up by your mother. And I would have to do this shame walk of like, okay, ADD moment over. <laughs> So Taylor has no friends. It's real tough. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay. Do you guys understand the point of it, though? 
Like, I have expectations in my relationships, and sometimes they're not met, and sometimes I go on Instagram, or you see the pictures, or you see the things, and you're like disappointed because the unhealthy expectation has been pulled to the table along with comparison. And now, instead of having like a hopeful heart, it's disappointment. And now that the table that God has prepared for you, it feels off. It feels like something in your soul doesn't feel right. There's the idea also of, um, of being a people pleaser. Like, God has prepared a table for me, and it is literally between me and him, him and I. And what happens is sometimes we pull a seat up to our table of someone else's opinion. And it sits there, and it whispers to me. I probably shouldn't share this, because who knows, but whatever. <laughs> I'm already in trouble. <laughs> and please don't feel sorry for me. This is just, I want to be authentic, so please, no pity. I found out this week that someone emailed the church and was like, is there a calendar of preachers? Because I want to know when Doc's preaching, and if he's not preaching, just take me off the list. And so, trigger, <laughs> uh, I felt like someone else's opinions got scooted up to my table. And I sat and I listened to it. I was like, bro, I get it. I want to hear dad too. <laughs> then it was like, you are not good enough. You will not cut it. What will become of the church? And I let the voice sit at the table. Am I pleasing man, or am I walking into my destiny with my Heavenly Father? Sometimes we pull up the wrong voice and we let it sit and we let it have a place at the table and God is saying, I prepared the table for you. I prepared it for you in the presence of your enemies, not for you to scoot them up, pull them on in, and sit and cozy up with them. Sometimes my soul, like out of my deep love for my family, sometimes I get disorganized. And sometimes I'll put like, Jacob on the throne. And I'm seeking all my affirmation. I'm seeking all the things that I need as a woman for my husband. And that's a big toll, okay? Especially for a broken, crazy lady like I. That is a lot to ask of one man. And then when he doesn't meet it, I'm mad, right? Anyone know how that feels? Has anyone ever disorganized the place at the table. And you've put someone in front when there's only one throne. There's only one seat. There's one head, and that is our Father who loves you. It is our Father who, no matter what, will fill the need of my heart. And I do not need to look through for the affirmation or the misplacement. Sometimes I think this is, um, it's a, uh, the victim, where my soul's hurt, maybe there's been trauma, maybe there's been things, but I pull the seat of the victim up and say, sit down, baby, you want a french fry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> here's some steak, and I, I don't take life and live it the way that God has called me to because I'm playing a card of no control, of poor me. And it's not the table that my Heavenly Father has prepared for me. Can I get an amen? amen? There is a soul within us, and it is alive. It is a living being. It makes up everything that we are. Everything that we are is our soul, and it's living. So we either can feed it and make it healthy, or man, can we neglect it and let it wither. In the book I'm reading from this woman that I forget her name and the name of the book, so it's very helpful for you. 
she talks about this idea of what are the symptoms of a healthy soul. And I sat down and I thought for myself, what are the symptoms of a healthy soul for me? And I wrote, um, like, there's a lightness. How do you want to have the breathing, like, where you just can't catch your breath? Like, sometimes that breath. Like, for me, when, my, when it is well with my soul, I breathe at ease. There's a lightness. For me, there is a joy. You got the book? <laughs> this is my partner. Okay, it's called Discovering Soul Care by Mindy Caliguire. She says uh, there's a joy about it. Here's, what, here's some of her definition. A healthy soul, the symptoms are love, joy, and receiving. Giving and receiving. Did everyone hear that? Grace, generosity of spirit, peace, ability to trust. Uh-oh. <laughs> discernment, humility, creativity, vision. Man, creativity and vision, something comes alive in me when my soul is healthy. Balance and focus. But here's the symptoms of an unhealthy soul. Self-absorption. Shame. Have you ever invited shame of every wrong thing you've ever done to come sit at the table with you? Apathy, toxic anger, physical fatigue, isolation, a stronger temptation to sin, drivenness. I also want to add laziness. Feeling of desperation, panic, insecurity, callousness, a judgmental attitude, cynicism, and a lack of desire for God. I want you to sit, and if you can, think about these two questions. What are the symptoms of a healthy soul for you? For me, it's joy. For me, it's a lightness of spirit. For me, it's I can handle things, and I want to engage. I want to be a part. I get excited about the vision and the creativity of what we can do in my home and what we can do in the church. What does a healthy soul look like for you? What are the symptoms? And then what are the symptoms of an unhealthy soul? For me, I sat and I thought, and I was like, okay, I get depressed. I get lazier. Um, I control. <laughs> She's real fun to be around, folks. <laughs> real treat. But there are symptoms of discontent in my heart when my soul is off, when it's not firing when it's not healthy in all the aspects of how God created us. And so I want to ask you, what are the symptoms of yours? I was looking back at Psalms 23, and I saw it with fresh eyes, and I'd love to share what I saw. Psalms 23 is written by David. David's a shepherd. He was a shepherd. He got chosen to be king. He became king, but there was a lot of heartache. There was a lot of pain. And um, then he became king and he reigned. And so there was like, his life was never super smooth. And as I was reading Psalms 23, a lot of scholars will break it up as like this shepherd section and then this host section. Like he talks about God preparing a table before you. And I saw it with fresh eyes of like, no, this is David thinking about his life. Like, part of me believes Psalms 23 is David's going back to the beginning. See, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, but David was a shepherd boy, and so he knows the, the job of a shepherd. And he's sitting and he's thinking about what, what his life was like, and he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. I imagine David thinking about those times when those sheep were hungry and how God met their need, how he uh, restored something inside of David because David's own family never chose him. In 1 Samuel 17, David is out in the field being a shepherd, and a prophet comes to David's family, and he says, uh, hey, I want to see all your sons. And David's dad brings seven of them, 
and never even invites David to the table. And God is very clear that none of these boys are the man that is going to be the next king. And so this prophet says to Jesse, David's dad, he said, is this all your sons? And Jesse says, no, I've got one more. And he's like, well, go get him. And they send a servant. And in my mind's eye, I see the servant running and he's screaming, David, David, David. And David is sitting with his sheep and he's taking care of them. And, and he goes and he sees this prophet. When his own family did not invite him to the table, God found him. God brought him in. And David shows up in this room, and the prophet's there, and God speaks loudly and says, This is my son. Anoint him with oil. And David's now saying, God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and he anointed my head with oil. God chose me. He prepared a future for me that I had no idea, but because I am chosen, he anointed me with oil. And I think about this man now looking back on his life, writing Psalms 23, and putting his perspective in who God is. And I think, what a healthy soul. What a healthy soul that can see God every step of his life. Some of the enemies at our table are the trauma and the pain and the hurt of life. And it's hard to see God in those moments because we have an idea of who God is and how he should be. And when he doesn't fit what we think he should be, there's a true ache in our soul. But David's looking back on his life, and I feel like he's seeing God like fresh. He's seeing God, and he's seeing you set the table before me. You anointed me. It was nobody else. And when our hope is in the wrong things, and we've invited the enemy to our table, to our soul, there are going to be symptoms that come. But there is only one cure for the soul, and it is turning our focus from our problems, our life, and turning our focus onto the praise and worship of who God is. All throughout Scripture, you will see it time and time and time again. And the cure for the soul is our openness and our receptivity to God in our lives. Would you be willing to be open to God in a new way? I am going to have the band come up. I um, met with the team for CC Midweek last week. And it was Tuesday. I said, guys, I've got nothing. <laughs> like, I'm not joking. I've got nothing. And they all looked at me a little worried. <laughs> They're like, you're the preacher. You're going to need to find something, sister. And I was like, there's just, there's a disconnect in my soul, and I just can't figure it out. And I told them, I was like, I'll pick a topic. Let's just, we'll talk about trust, okay? I'll find a scripture. It'll be fine. We got this. And my sister, Carrie Kuyat, plug Carrie. Ow, ow, <laughs> She sends us worship songs from time to time. And my, my soul had been triggered. Rejection has run deep in my life, and it had just been triggered. But I didn't even realize it. You see, the discontent in my soul was I was listening to the enemy's voice, and I didn't even know it, and so I was, I was disconnected from the life that he wanted me to have because I was just thinking about, like, rejection has been from the time I was a little girl, all throughout school. My marriage has had moments of rejection. The church, sometimes it's the beautiful gift, but man, can it hurt. And there was just... It's a trigger for me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like something happens and you're like, all the pain happens. Because deep within our soul, we hold the wounds. Deep within our soul, we hold the pain. Because it is a living being. 
And our God wants something better for us. He wants us to not be so busy that we can't hear the cry of our soul. And he doesn't want us to be so stuck in it that it's all we think about. He wants us to have help. He wants us to have connection. He wants us to have relationship with him because he is the cure to the deepest part of my rejection. You know who has never rejected me? My mighty God. He has found me. When I was not invited to the table, he invited me to the table. And I want you to know he invites you to the table because he has prepared it for you. And the, the cry of our soul, it's longing for something so much more. And my beautiful Carrie, she sent this song, and I just sat on the couch. It's like my spot to study. And I played it over and over and over again. And it says, what a father, what a friend, what a savior you are. It talks about we are not alone. And I listened to it over and over and over again because the cry of my soul, something longed to hear it. And I'm going to have them play it right now because I want you to just sit with your Heavenly Father. I want you to think about He has chosen you special, that you are loved, that you are chosen, and whatever the cry of your soul is, He is the answer. Just take a listen to the words.
soul care, and I know that my connectivity and my responsivity, that's not a word, my responsiveness to God is what draws me in. So church, we are not neglecters of the soul. We are men and women who are loved by a heavenly father. When my soul cries out, the answer of our soul will always be to turn to God. And when I think about the soul, the soul care, sometimes I'm overwhelmed because it's like, oh, this is a lot of work, so many parts. And I go back to Psalms 23 and it says, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before you. Me, you anoint my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You are not alone. And the cry of our soul needs to be answered with the connection of Christ because he does the heavy lifting. When we trust him, and we say, what a father, what a friend, what a savior, my soul becomes alive. There's a connection when I stop letting the neglect of the soul, when I stop letting the wrong things at my table and start introducing the right things into my life. There is a connection. There is an integration within me where it is alive and it is well with my soul.
And these kids, I wish they could sing everything and that's what I could hear. The goal for you is to look within and what are the symptoms of a healthy soul? What are the symptoms of an unhealthy soul? But let's not just be symptom finders, okay? Uh, the goal is not to be like, oh, uh, the symptom of a healthy soul is joy, so I'm going to seek joy, seek joy, seek joy. I'm going to play pickleball all the time because it brings me joy. That's not the goal. The goal is to get to the root. The goal is to hear the true cry of the soul and what is your soul truly longing for and then going to your heavenly father and just asking him because he is your father, he is your friend, and he is a great and mighty savior. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will fill us, that you will restore my soul, Father, that you will restore the souls of every person in this room and every person online, Father. I pray where there is a cry, you will hear it. You will help us articulate it, and we will seek you. Because, Father, when we seek you with all our heart, the promise you have made is that we will find you. So I pray that you will put inside of every single person, Father, that they will have a longing, a crying of seeking and knowing you more. In your mighty and awesome son's name we pray, amen. I love you guys. I'll see you Sunday.